Hey, how are you? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, shalom, shalom, my friends, shalom, my enemies. We are talking with the one, the only, the comical and love. Wait, what, what, was, what was that you just hid from the camera? What are you sipping there? What are you eating? What's that snack? Oh, my coffee. Oh, it didn't look like it looked like a, a package of something. It oh, like this. A, my little cue sheet. Okay. An old flyer. That was it. I saw the red thing. You, old you flyer. You can't hide anything from me, Rochelle Ellie. You cannot. It's so lovely to finally meet you, Rabbi Saul Solomon. After all these years, this is oh, true. How are you? I am amazing. I'm I'm doing as well as I can be in this uh, in in this mess that we're in. But you know what? I've just had a lovely walk with my husband and my dog, and uh, I have my first coffee of the day, and I'm live on Facebook with with famous Rabbi Saul Solomon. Best, best rabbi, rabbi ever. ever. And I see that in the back here, it says topical rash. Yes. Did you right. know my nickname is Rash? Oh, no, I did not know I, that. I'm the I, only reoccurring rash you're happy to have back. Ba-dum-bum. <laughs> now, are you, are you in Canada right now? Are you in another country as we speak? Right now, as we speak, I am in Ottawa, Canada. Yes, Canada's capital. Is it? Oh, yeah. I, I, I learned the capitals and then I forgot them because they weren't in Hebrew. So Ottawa, what is Ottawa like? Um, Ottawa is a beautiful city. I actually was in Toronto for almost 25 years and we've just moved five years ago to Ottawa. So Ottawa is definitely known as the city that fun forgot, but uh, it's definitely become a much more interesting city. And it was funny during the pandemic because we were open because Ottawa is a lot of civil servants, government workers. We tend to kind of go by the rules. I say we, I don't go by the rules, but civil servants tend to. So we actually didn't have as, as many cases as other places in Ontario, in our province. So places like Montreal were closed, places like Toronto were closed. And so for the first time in our lives as Ottawa, we were cooler than even cities like Paris, New York, because we were open. We stayed open for a long time. Never happened again. So when you say open though, did you, were you able to perform stand up in Ottawa yes. like six months ago? Oh yeah, well, and that's what I mean is a lot of my friends in Toronto have not been on a stage for seven months. Whereas we were, oh, we had about four months in there where we could go. I was performing in Kingston, just outside of Ottawa. I was performing in Ottawa. There's, we have two clubs main clubs, Absolute Comedy and Yuck Yucks in Ottawa. So I was able to go to the clubs and I live eight minutes from a beautiful town called Almont, Almonte. Um, and it's a beautiful town and they have a, a theater called the Town Hall, the old Town Hall. Uh, and our capacity there during the pandemic was 50. So I did my show Lady Rash, um, don't Google it. Nine vaginal rashes come up and then me, the only one with glitter, woohoo. <laughs> but I'm bump. <laughs> so, so when I, I am curious though, because because there's been until very recently nothing in New York. So when you were doing those shows in yes. Elmont or in uh, Ottawa and, and places that you could go, did the audience all wear masks? Were they singing together? Was it completely normal, or were there all these protocols in place? And oh. they just sit down and, and find something funny. It was very abnormal. Um, the Almont was a bit different because they were very strict, so people could only. Um, take their masks off if they were drinking something, but otherwise they had to have their masks on. Whereas in the clubs, the, the protocols are you get your temperature as you come in. Uh, you can only sit with four people maximum and they're supposed to be in your household. And you can only take your masks off when your food is served. You can eat. And um, but people are encouraged to leave their, their masks on, but people could take their masks off. So it wasn't so strict. But it, the weirdest thing was, First of all, c- comedy is contagious normally. Laughter is contagious. And suddenly laughter, if it's confined to, you know, two meters apart and little bubbles, I found as a comedian, we had to work a lot harder to get laughs. We had a lot of, um, a lot of headliners were only doing 30 minute sets instead of the usual 45 minutes because club owners didn't want to put that stress onto a comedian to have to have them laughing for 45 minutes. Um, so that was the, it, and again, I'm sure people getting back into the clubs in New York are experiencing that where you just, it's almost like when you're starting out and you get kind of mediocre laughs, that's kind of what a lot of us have had to go back to is jokes that, you know, will destroy with 200 to 500 to a thousand people. Suddenly those jokes, when you have 50 people, you just have to kind of get, let go of expectations and accept, okay, well, these are the laughs I'm going to get because and also because people are already uncomfortable, like, should we be out right now? Am I going to get sick? Is this right? Like, wh- who's this next to me who's coughed just now? So there's there's just kind of an extra tension and sensitivity to audiences right now. So I think 
a lot of people, a lot of comedians have had to be more sensitive. And I know you come from a theater background as a theater artist myself, I, I studied theater. I was, you know, on, on route to be an actress for many years. That sensitivity that you have to have in theater has definitely helped me in this pandemic because I've kind of had to go back to it instead of the stand up where it's there's a sort of an aggression with stand up where you do have to kind of force people into it's sales like you're forcing people to love what you're doing. Um, I find with this, the, the, the environment right now, you can't really push jokes down people's throats right now. You have to kind of just allow people to like take their time laughing and, and not be so pushy. Well, the thing is, oh, look who you're talking to. Not going to work for me. All I know is that <laughs> I'm used to in my sermons and wherever I do, I expect nobody to laugh at my jokes. It makes it much easier. <laughs> a joke, nobody laughs. I'm like, ah, eh, fuck you. I'm moving on. It's fine. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even worry about it. When, I love it that you throw F-bombs with no worries about it. Oh, not, none at all. I do it in the shul. It, 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 there's nobody <laughs> there. Anyway, it's fine. When did you realize, A, that you were funny and B, that you could be funny professionally? Well... It's interesting, and I'll, I'll give you a little antidote about that, because for me, my I started out uh, when I, I failed grade eight back in the day when they would fail kids. And and I always say the thing is I failed grade eight, which is a loser move, but I convinced my best friend to fail with me, which is a winner move. But during that second year of grade eight, I had a guidance counselor who I think figured out that I might be an artist. So he actually told me there's a, uh, an art school called Canterbury School of the Arts in Ottawa. Uh, maybe you want to audition. So I auditioned as a visual artist and I auditioned as a um, dancer and I got in for both. So I decided to go for dance. Long story short, I went in dance school. I got kicked out two years later because I wasn't very disciplined. I was a bit of a joker. Then I got into act to drama improv in another high school and then I was a model and then I a friend of mine who was um, helping me with modeling and stuff she said I think you might be an actress so I went to Bishop's University to study acting and I remember being uh, playing the role of Juliet in Romeo and Juliet and I had I played for three hours I was as you know Juliet's on stage almost the entire three hours and I had a two minute dance solo where I was doing flamenco dancing and everyone came up to me at the end of the show and said, Rochelle, you are an amazing dancer. And that was when I was starting to go, okay, I have the feeling I'm a really bad actress. <laughs> so <laughs> I, 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 you're, you're there for two hours and 58 minutes acting yeah. your, your, your ass yeah. off. And then for two minutes, you're dancing like, oh, you can really dance. I was like, this is not acting. a good it's, sign. This yeah. is not a good sign. So then oh, I went to- Hold it, stop right oh, there. Yes. So Romeo and Juliet, Yes. Italy, Verona, 1600, yes. something like 1500, 1600. Yes. Why are you doing flamenco? I think they wanted to do kind of a more with a Spanish flair. Okay. I think it was more like the Italians against the Spaniards. I don't know. They shifted it up a bit. I was wondering. I, I just kind of curious how flamenco <laughs> I now, don't I actually remember. I should ask my uh, my director from that time. I, I still Were they doing the Macarena also? Was yeah. It? Hey, 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 hey. When they taught us, they were saying, like, you have to pretend you're you're picking an apple off a tree. But I remember I really mastered that. But then I, I went to a professional acting school after that because I did, I think I had great potential. So I went to Studio 58 in Vancouver and I remember being in a circle of nine Lady Macbeths. <clears throat> and we had a voice teacher who was like, from your swamp, we want to hear Lady Macbeth from your guts. And the girl next to me was just a, such a natural actress. Um, Jan Ashley in her swamp was very elegant. She was like, Thane of Caudle, speak no more. Macbeth shall speak no more. And then it was, and, and, and the teacher was like, beautiful, Jan. That was fantastic. Then it was my turn. She was like, from your swamp, Rochelle. And I, I was like, okay, I'm going to do an amazing rendition of my swamp. And I was like, Thane of Caudle, speak no more. Macbeth shall speak no more. <laughs> Hot pickle tabernacle. And everybody <laughs> laughed. And I was like, oh, great. I am not an actress. I am a fucking clown and to end this story a friend of mine came up to me after that and he said listen we weren't laughing with you we were laughing at you and I was so upset by that and I really tried to hide the fact that I was funny I was just in my life I'm funny but I'm going to be a serious actress and I remember the the breaking point was that I was at my best friend's house she was having a very serious satyr ceremony and I thought it would be funny when she was doing all the 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 singing to say show us your tits who says you're jewish and everybody like a friend of mine came up to me at the end of it and said 
that was too far. Like you, yeah. you, you went too far. Your grandpa and you were like, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. And I almost, I almost lost uh, a couple friends during that. And I realized like, I have a problem. It's a disease. I can't stop making people laugh. So that was when I started doing stand-up comedy and really um, threw myself into stand-up comedy in the nineties, late nineties in Toronto, when there was a real uh, stand-up comedy boom. And then I moved into one person shows. Was it like here in America where it was, I guess it was the 80s and 90s where there were, every town had five comedy clubs and every person who did one good set suddenly got a TV show. Was it sort of like that in, in Canada too? Unfortunately, t well, I, actually, I shouldn't, we, you wouldn't get a TV show, but you would get on TV and there were TV spots, but I mean, they paid like three to $500. So, but it wasn't like it actually made or break, could break your career. I don't think, I think the, in the U S you guys have definitely the, the sort of system set up with, you can get on, um, late night with so many different, different, amazing hosts, hosted shows, but we just, we had, I think the Mike Bullard show at that time, but it, it just, I got on TV, but again, then I, sh I shifted out of it. So I got more into one woman shows and stuff like that. But well, I think we had a lot of comedy clubs, but just not as many sort of make or break moments. Now the difference, um, do you prefer, first of all, in the, the long run, the stand up comedy, go to the club, kill for 45 to 55 minutes or so, or going to the fringe festival, going to the off, off or off Broadway type place and doing a comic piece but it's more comic theater which which or do you just love them both the thing is when you mention fringe compared to a club the thing i love about the club is that i don't have to work to get the audience i don't have to go out and flyer i don't have to try to sell my show and when i did the fringe for almost 10 years so much of the fringe is also the hustle of trying to convince people to come to your show you get a five-star review you know you've sold out you don't have to flyer you get a two-star review you're gonna have to be out there like six hours a day asking people to come to your show dealing with moody people in the lineup being rude to you and stuff like that so i don't miss that um i love I think I love theater and doing one woman shows where I can actually really move people and take them on a journey. I love that equally as I love doing a one hour stand up comedy set. It's just, it's the business side of it that I always hate having to do. And so I think I really, I mean, I love being able to just go to a comedy club and even just do a set, like do 10 minutes or do an hour and be able to get that immediate rush often when i'm doing my one woman shows i am the one that's getting there to set up i you know engage friends and family even i do cabarets i i enjoy doing that what i love about that is bringing together a community of artists and multidisciplinary artists coming together and creating a produ production and me being kind of the the link in, or the gel for everyone to come together in that so i i i, I love having audiences and just being able to put on shows for them, no matter what kind of show. Um, I think right now I, I do prefer stand up in a way because it's very straightforward. It's kind of like tell a joke, get a laugh. Whereas like, I also do a character that really reminds me of you. His name's Joe. And I did a one person show with him called Joe, the perfect man. It's an hour show. I think you'd really enjoy it, but he's got, I've been doing a few uh, live on Facebook with him but he, it's more complicated. Like clown is very complicated in that you can completely destroy and everything's in line, but because clown is so much about failure and beautiful failure and making failure wonderful, I think it's more complicated compared to telling jokes. Yes, yeah, exactly. Failure magnificent. Yes. Resplendent yes. failure. I am. This is, this is, I'm proud of it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And As that's like, speaking of things that you can watch you do one of your shows at least is viewable on uh, YouTube, if you'll pardon the expression there. Shit, I'm in love with you again. You yes. can actually watch the, the whole show for free. But what else, where else can people see you currently, virtually, et cetera, and so forth? Well, I do have my YouTube channel, Rochelle Ellie. Um, and I have a lot of my, not necessarily my one hour shows, but a lot of my sets and my bits. I also have the, the new podcast. If you want to hear me do long form interviews with comedians. And the nice thing about it is that there's not a lot of, uh, long form interview shows in English, focusing on Canadian comedians and their process. And that's really the focus here is on the joke writing process, what it's like, what our industry's like. 
a lot of the comedians I've interviewed have gone on and moved to LA. So talking about the transition from moving to Canada to, to the United States. Um, so I find that's, that's available on any audio platform. I'm on Spotify. Buzzsprout is my main host for that. I'm on, uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram too. I've been posting a lot of kind of 30 second videos on Instagram and I'm Rash Ellie on Instagram. Rash, R-A-C-H. R-A-S-H, R-A-S-H oh, actually. Rash. Yeah, That's Rash. Really like the Rash. Yeah. Your <laughs> website is also, they've got Rash Ellie. Well, that, that, you have RashelleEllie.com. Rachel Ellie, yeah. You, it's also crowningmonkey.com. I'm, I'm, wait, what? Uh, crowning monkey that was uh the name of my production company for a very long time crowning monkey because i'm married to an obstetrician gynecologist oh well, come yeah. on i call him obi gyne kenobi <laughs> i like that yeah how'd you meet your your uh, gyno husband there um i was working at sophie's cosmic cafe in vancouver he had just uh, been camping for two months doing the west coast trail just out of med school and uh, we he came into my cafe and he was sitting on the patio and I was working inside and I was like I'm taking the patio so uh the rest is history <laughs> I moved to Toronto and uh and uh we lived in Toronto together for 25 years and we have two teenage boys now McMuzzle McGlick so it's uh, a pretty perfect uh, life there especially for someone who's devoted their life to art and comedy it does not always go so well but- well you know honestly when I started out uh I really I believed in putting out to the universe what you want. And I realized at a certain point, if I, because I'm a painter as well, I realized I, I need a philanthropist. So I actually co- contacted the Toronto Philanthropy Society. Um, and, and it was funny because it was like the universe. I was like, I need a philanthropist. And then I fell in love with a doctor. So it was kind of funny because I was like, I didn't really ask for a family. I didn't ask for love. I asked for philanthropy and it came in a different form. So again, there's, you know, when you end up married with kids and also having to support a doctor and a lot of people are like, oh, you're so lucky you're married to a doctor. Well, the reality is like he, we worked in Kenya. He, wow. he's a humanitarian. So I had to, I've had to support and as much as he supports my dreams, I also have supported his career as a doctor. So it it wasn't in the form that I thought it would be, but I'm also very grateful for how it, it came to me. <laughs> well, do you have any amazing stories of spending like two months in deepest, dark, semi-darkest Africa? Do I have stories of it? Oh my God, I have I have songs, I have tons. I have a, part of my Shit I'm In Love With You Again show is about our time in Kenya. So one of the anecdotes I'll tell is, or even just stories is, it was interesting being there um, because they had a, there's a very special nickname when I was there that people called me Mazungu. Um, but but Mazungu. Mazungu. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it translates into something like white rich bitch. Or if you're French, it's tit carlis de bitch rich blanche. And this is why we speak English. Cause I yeah, it sounds fancier, people. right? Right. But okay. it was, it was fascinating. My kids went to school there. I remember one of my sons has really curly hair and there was a little girl in his school who would try to touch his hair and he would climb to the highest part of the playground to try to get get her to not be able to touch his, touch his hair and my other son in canada he was struggling with friendships but because he was the only white kid in the class at lunch when he went to the bathroom all of the class followed him to the bathroom all the boys went into the bathroom with him and then when he came out all of the kids followed him around the playground he was he came home that day and he said mom i know what it's like to have too many friends now <laughs> <laughs> they just want to know what a small white penis looks like you know the rest of the, they, 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 <laughs> the bottom of the river and he's like oh yeah no this is real it, it won't grow anymore <laughs> oh my god oh you took it there I, of course I took it. I take, of yeah. course I take it there. By the way, you you said you you married a Jewish uh, man guy. Uh, is it an op guy? You met, or your best friend was he, Jewish? Yes, my, my actually even the um the gentleman who wrote all of the co wrote the songs for "Shit I'm in Love with You Again," Luke Jackson. He's also Jewish. I tend to have a lot of Jewish friends, and for a long time I thought I was part Jewish because the first. Eli, Pascal Eli, who left France and went to Haiti, I always heard he was Juif in French Jewish. Right. And then I found out, and I was always like, ah, oh, not, but it was the dad's side and not enough to join the club. Like I really wanted to join, right? And yeah. then I found out, I then I found out he was Lebanese. So I think he was actually Jewish Lebanese. And then he went to Haiti and started his family there. So it's all- it's the, Lebanese the are girls who like girls. I don't understand what that has to do with it. <laughs> so how were you, were you raised 
Catholic Protestant. I was raised Catholic because my dad, my mom was American. She was more Protestant, and my dad was very Catholic. He was um, from Haiti, so he was raised Catholic, and uh, he was kind of loosey goosey Catholic. But both my husband and I were raised Catholic. And are both yeah, now yeah. on the atheist side of things. Oh, all right. Well, yeah. how are you raising the the well, they're teenagers now? But did you yes. instill in them any kind of religious, or are you just like, yeah, you be what you want to be? I guess I think I'm agnostic, right? Where isn't agnostic where you kind of believe in spirituality and you believe that there's something there, but you're kind of also not really like you're not doing anything about it. Something like that. Yeah. I get it's religious like when I'm you. flying. That's it. Yeah. All right. This is. And I feel like we're cr crashing, but I do. I mean, I'm very spiritual, and I, I. Uh, I've studied a lot of clowning and there's something called Canadian clowning. And there's a real sort of like, you make six masks for every direction of yourself. And that is like, it's definitely a spiritual practice in that it's a lot about energy and bringing in different parts of yourself and, and looking like North, South, East, West, like directional kind of stuff. So it's very airy fairy, but I'm kind of, I think I take a bit of the voodoo religion from my Haitian culture and they're like well, without... how have you ever used voodoo how do you do uh, that? i've i've used voodoo i i in my show i talk about one time like people say to never go to bed angry and i go to bed furious like i'm i'm friggin breaking up with you in your sleep and then i voodoo curse my husband i voodoo cursed my husband many times where i'm like sending bad vibes to him or and, i've done that and yeah. he wakes up with what a hernia what what happens no it doesn't really do anything but it makes me feel better <laughs> okay he knows this he realizes this that you're he, oh yeah i've talked to him about it him. yeah yeah he's on top of it like in my show too i i was like oh i should call you a jerk he's like no no call me an asshole asshole's stronger it is it, it kind of is if you've it's ever what, seen in uh, action it's yeah it's, <laughs> it's enormously pliable but well when, he, I assume he's right there because you keep looking off to the. the no, hello. it's I'm I'm looking at my microphone to 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 pull it. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh. But no, he, my husband, we're so different, right? He got. I always say he got ninety eight percent in university calculus. What an asshole! Like you know what I got in calculus zero. I don't actually know what it is. Oh, well, I never took it. I I don't. I'm not clear on what it is. But if you know what it is, you might be an asshole. So so let me <laughs> speaking. You can be, the interesting thing is that you can be a comedic asshole in both English and French. Do you do the same jokes? Do they work the same way in both languages? Because if, if you if you have a Seinfeld, he trims the jokes down to the word, to the yes. way they're arranged. But yes. if you're translating, uh, that kind of goes out the window a little bit. So how does it work in two languages? Well, as you know, French is a little bit like Italian and that it's very flowery, romantic language. So definitely, my dad was french speaking and i find like instead of saying i love you he would say it in like 10 sentences you know it's very poetic language so i think that what i've discovered is i tend to try to trim the joke in french like in english it's crafted and i guess what i'm saying too to to just set it up i have my english jokes that work and because i started in english comedy it's been two years i've been doing french comedy and now i'm just translating my english jokes into french so i know they work it's just a matter of figuring out how to make them work in french efficiently with a language that actually takes a little longer to get to the point so i have been working i worked at, i've engaged a writer who's french so he understands kind of how people would take the joke and it's been good to work with someone else and get some feedback. And then also just to get on stage and work with French audiences and see, okay, they tend to laugh because sometimes they'll laugh after the punch or before the punch, like it kind of almost gets reversed because if you understand French, like I could say in French it, it, saying, um, like if you say one, if you're just saying something like, um, how are you? No, that's not a good, I can't really think of a good example, but if you say something in English with two words, often in French, it will be, take five words. So it's just a matter of like, I have a similar pro process like Seinfeld, like most standups do is it's efficiency and you don't want too many words to get to the punch for the setup. But what I have found is because French is so descriptive, sometimes it's if it's been good for my english jokes because when i go back and do the jokes in english i use a bit more description and words to kind of enhance the setup a bit because in the setup you want to be efficient but you also want to like the joke that you played about my kids playing yellow car safety um i say 
my kids want to play this punching game and I don't want to be looking for yellow cars. I'm looking for parking. So I used to just say, I'm, I don't want to be looking for yellow cars, but through doing it in French, I got the, I'm looking for parking uh, tag, or I guess it's, it is a punch. I got that and was able to bring it back into my English comedy. So it has been really good because I think French jokes tend to have more setup and their punches are strong, but English is such an efficient language. Like even French people will say English is better for comedy. It's better for stand up. So coming from okay. English into French is, is a strength. And when you say you have French audiences, I would imagine, and I could be completely wrong about this, that French Canadians are automatically bilingual. English Canadians, not necessarily just speak English. Are, are there people who just speak French? In that I country? think What's ten, them? well, 15, 20 years ago, for sure, there would have been areas of Quebec that you could go to where people would not speak any English. I do think that Netflix and the internet has changed that in that people, even when I was in France, I did some shows in Paris two years ago. I met a woman who had taught herself how to speak English through Netflix, through watching movies and having subtitles on all the time. So I, I don't think it's as common anymore, but when I was a teenager or even just in my twenties, I think I could go to different areas of Quebec and meet people who did not speak any English, but it's rare now. I, I, it's really rare. But you still purposely, just for a cultural thing, you kind of wanted to dive into the French side of things. You know what, Toronto where I was living is five hours from Montreal which is a major city, a French city in Quebec. Moving here, I'm only two hours away and there's a lot of uh, amazing things happening in Montreal. And I've realized that it's a mini Hollywood, like a lot of Quebec comedians do not leave Canada to make their careers, to make themselves stars. Whereas a lot of Canadian comedians go away to the United States, to LA or New York to become stars. It's just kind of a system that's set up like Samantha B is Canadian. When she went to the US, she made her fame in the US. So right. what I've realized is I don't really want to leave Canada. I love being here with my family. I love my family and friends here. So Quebec, because I'm French speaking as well, it's an opportunity for me to kind of take part in that. And I only discovered it, I discovered it three years ago. And the way I discovered it is I went on a, med I've been on many meditation retreats. I don't know if you've heard of Vipassana meditation, but I went to a retreat and at the end of the retreat, like if you're a comedian at a silent retreat for the nine days, you're writing material and just like, can't wait to get out and try them but everyone comes out of their cocoon of silence. And that's when I start nailing people with jokes. And so I was at a retreat and everyone was French and it was the first time that it was a completely French speaking retreat. And I realized like, okay, I actually can make people laugh in French. So that was a pivotal moment for me to go, oh, I actually, I forgot that I was funny in French. And so, I mean, I, I went to high school in French too, and I was in um, like started in kindergarten in all French school. So I realized I've been making French people laugh for a long time. I just stopped when I was in my, I guess when I was about 13. See, I know nothing about uh, meditation. Medication I take uh, a tremendous amount <laughs> for obvious reasons. But uh, meditate, now, now meditate on this everybody. I want to remind everyone that you can find our guest, Rochelle Ellie, first of all at Rochelle Ellie.com, R A C H E L L E E L I E. Damn it. Look at so many vowels. <laughs> RochelleEllie.com. Plus, uh, she has a, a podcast called Comedy Nerd. And of course, yes. the, the French way, Comedy Nerd. Yes, with an I. C O M E D I. Nerd. And you can find that on all the your Spotify. What was your hosting thing? What's the big one? Uh, Buzz Sprout. Buzz Sprout. I've never heard of this, but it sounds cute. Buzz yeah. Sprout is a is it buzzsprout.com. People can go and uh, find yes. the podcast. Okay. Yes. And what else? What uh, tell us again. You can find her on YouTube on her YouTube channel. Is that one the one with the S, the Rash Ellie? No, that's Rochelle Ellie, same okay. as my my name. And then uh Instagram is Rash Ellie. That's the one. The Instagram is the Rash Ellie, where you're doing a little half a minute bips and uh, bips. yes like yes and exactly and can i ask you a question yeah, of course you may H have you been on stage and done stand-up i have done a uh, very little stand-up but i had a one person a uh, two man one person show 
So there's the contradiction right there. A musical comedy called Shalom, Damn It, An Evening with Me, <laughs> by Saul Solomon, which played uh, off off Broadway at uh, the Richmond Shepherd Theater and then a small theater in New York and Midtown. So been there, done that, yes. Colorado. I would love to do it. I would love to bring the show to Canada and then do this hilarious video. If people want to watch, it's on YouTube as well or at my website, shalomdammit.com because uh, we recorded it and it's brilliant. It's Well, because you're, you're a, a closeted stand-up comedian. If I've ever seen one, I can <laughs> spot it. I taught stand-up for a while and I'm like, have I Sol Solomon wants to get on stage and tell jokes? Tomorrow. So, and it's the aggression. That's what you're talking It's about going out yeah. there and being like, yes. I'm going to make you laugh or I'm going to kill you. One of the two. <laughs> One of us will you, you, you'll be doubled over bleeding or doubled over laughing. Well, Seinfeld talks about that, right? Of of how the source of his jokes is like, you, you in a way, he feels like most comedians are, are quite angry and irrita irritable about you need to be irritable about something or dissatisfied. That's why he said with fame, it became difficult because he lost a bit of that edge and he had to kind of figure out how to get that. But then he said, oh, I had kids and a, and a wife. Now now it's all back. <laughs> and you, because you have, as I said, you have this fantastic life. You've got the, the great husband, you got the kids, you've got the wonderful life, you're doing what you want to do and you're painting and you're performing and yet you still have to go into those recesses I'm like, oh, God damn it. And pff, out it comes as a joke. But I'm always deeply dissatisfied with my life. And I think it's because I never thought I would have kids or be married. I thought I would be a star. So for no matter what I do, I'm always striving to be better than I am in my career. So maybe I'll always be a little bit dissatisfied, even though on the outside people go, you have everything I want. But it's like, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's still not enough. You're, you're um, you are Jewish. You just don't know. What you <laughs> Can I ask you your partner's name, who you always talk to over there? Well, um, I, for, for many years, I've been married to my darling uh, wife, Miriam Libby. We have 21 and a half beautiful children. Well, wow. they're not all beautiful. There's some inbreeding going on, but most of them are, are quite <laughs> beautiful. And yeah. they give me naches, but also tremendous amounts of rage and pain. So this is thing I have. Well, hello to Libby for me. Miriam Libby, Miriam Libby. She Miriam Libby. Hyphen. Yeah, uh, she, I, I broke her hyphen when we got married, but you know, don't even know what that <laughs> means. I'm sorry. So <laughs> Libby, speaking of, aside from this one, tell us about your worst hell gig. Oh, my, my worst gig. I can actually tell you that. Uh, oh, actually, this is this is kind of funny. Um, I tend to just keep coming back to Judaism because I started in French comedy two years ago and I met a producer and she saw me do a sh I did her show and she was blown away by my performance. Like she told me, I'm, I'm not bragging about it. She was really, um, really in, in liking what I did. And she said, listen, I have a gig for you. My rabbi uh, wants me to have an opportunity to show off what it is that I do in the comedy clubs. And I thought of you because you're bilingual and the audience will be um, in English and French. Um, it's at a Purim ceremony. And, and I didn't know anything about a Purim ceremony, but I said, listen, like, let's, let's just make sure that this is an appropriate gig for me because first of all, will there be kids? No, no, there won't be kids. So don't worry about it. And I said, well, if it's a very religious ceremony, can't we assume that people will be a little bit conservative and maybe doing comedy at that? Like I can do really clean comedy if I need to, but is it an appropriate? And she said, no, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. So a couple days before she said, listen, it sounds like there's going to be about two or three kids, but they might not even be in the room. So I show up at the gig. Oh, no. This is two years ago. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I have not had a situation like this in a long time. I show up at the Purim ceremony right when I arrive. Six kids go by to the right. Another six kids, all kids waist, waist level. Okay. These are little kids back and forth, back and forth. I go in and I'm already thinking that this does not, this does not seem appropriate environment. There's a band on stage and it's, um, I think they're playing like Yiddish tunes. Everybody's freaking out. The band is amazing. And I'm thinking the band should probably just stay on right now. I don't think this is going to work. Yeah. So everything in my body is like, don't, 
do it. Don't do it. And I had 15 minutes. I did 11 minutes. And at one point when I, I get on stage and I do my first joke, uh, I've been married 25 years, same guy for 25 years. We're still madly in love. Thanks to therapy. Anybody in therapy out there? No laughs, no laughs, except for one drunk guy at the back. You knew he was like the loose cannon. And then I said, my mom always said, getting married's like making pancakes. Sometimes you got to throw the first one out. That's cute. I like that. Nobody oh, laughed oh. because nobody wanted to say divorce is funny. And I got the feeling that no one in the crowd was divorced. Or, yeah. And, and at that point, kids start gathering to the front of the stage. I'm talking like 20 children and they're jumping up and down. And I'm like, I should have brought my magic tricks. And I had a magic trick. I did one magic trick. And I was like, you know, something's dead wrong at a stand up show when the only thing that kills is the magic trick. So I left well, the you stage also and I was like, like five minutes of vulva material. And yeah, I, oh, I, I, exactly. I, 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 but it just, you know what? It, it didn't matter what I did. I just don't think it was an appropriate venue. And it, the good thing was, I went up and did a set at a comedy club called Le Baldel in Montreal that night. Yeah. And I did the same material and it was one of the best sets I've ever done. So I was like, okay, listen, like I'm at, I'm at a point of maturity in my life where I know I should have from the get go said, this isn't going to be the right environment. Like I I'm, I'm good at saying no to stuff like that now, but I, because I sort of trusted this person, I was like, okay, let's just see if it works. But it was, it was a big, no, <laughs> it was a big, no, but you got a paycheck. Sometimes that's the best. No, I don't even think I got paid. Oh, no. Well, I don't, I think it was perform at my shul. If it worked for free and then my <laughs> shul is the size of a gas station, I'm lucky if I get two people there. One I don't usually work did. for free either, but it was kind of a situation where I was like, oh, I'll, I'll, uh, because we're building a relationship uh, yeah. and building trust. I was like, oh, I'll do it, do it for her. Well, I'm sure you engendered so much trust that night. Let me tell oh, you. Oh my goodness. Oh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with Rochelle Ellie. Hey. Let me oh, Rochelle, Rochelle. Rochelle, Rochelle, and uh, another, how many Seinfeld res references can only one Jew in the room make? I don't know. But Rochelle, Rochelle, <laughs> L-E-E-L-I-E. -E -L -I -E. Yes. You go to her website, RochelleEllie.com. You want to go to her yes. podcast on buzzsprout.com, B-U-Z-Z, sprout.com. Also, her YouTube page where you can literally, you see one of her long form shows. Shit, I'm in love with you again. Um Yes. Shall we end with the, the Seinfeld song? Do you know the words? No, I don't know. Please, please, please. Well, you made a long journey from Milan to Minsk, Rochelle, Rochelle. Da 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 da, -da. Now you're in the pinks, like, Rochelle, uh, Rochelle. Well, the naysayers said, get da 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 da. I don't even remember the words. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pick up the pace. You're, you're having adventures all over the place, Rochelle, Rochelle. Rochelle, Rochelle, it has been delightful and lovely to talk with you. I'm going to invite you back. Next time, maybe you'll stay and play the trivia game now that you know this is a sort of yes. a safe, relatively safe space. Uh, you, later in the show, all things get crazy and the firemen get cold. I'm sure. But for thank now, you so much for having me. Thank you. You've been absolutely delightful. We're going to bring Dave back now to continue the rest of the show with the one, the only Steve the Whistler Herbst coming in. Don't go away and shalom to you thank you rochelle shalom goodbye i'll be right back or dave will